Well, this September has been especially busy as we are gearing up for ministry to start well in the next week on Sunday. And there's lots going on. You probably noticed that there's been a lot of different avenues in which we have talked about serving. Maybe you got an email, maybe you saw it on Facebook, you probably have that paper in front of you today that it was given to you. And the reason why we're talking about serving, and all of you are invited to serve, is because ministry doesn't happen without you, without your involvement with us. And so our hope is that through a sermon series on what, it, what does it mean to be the church, our hope is that God, by His Word, has been reminding you and revealing to you in the way that you could serve in the church, the way that he has designed you to serve. And I hope that this sermon series and on what it means to be the church, what is the church, what is the church supposed to be doing, I hope that it's been helpful for you. I know that I've had a lot of new conversations with people that have said that this has really gotten them thinking. And so I pray that the scriptures would continue to be submitted to and, uh, and be leading us as a church. And so to the point where, biblically speaking, we as elders or people one to another could be asking each other, where are you serving the local body? And, and we don't need to feel bad about it because what we want is for everyone to be doing exactly what God has designed you and empowering you to do in his church. And so some of the ways that I, I just want to make an announcement, of, uh, especially in terms of our kids' ministries, those do require adults who are able to lead children and their classrooms and things like that. We've gotten a, a, a quite a variety of people that are involved in Bright Lights, which, is, uh, which happens during the service, during the sermon. And we've also got our Christian education classes, and they're getting geared up. But we are still in need of some people that would like to lead or co-lead one of those classes. And so as one of the options, if you're feeling led or the Lord um, is leading you to do that, please come talk to me or somebody about that. We are looking for more people still there as well. But I will do that. I will say that in faith, knowing that the Lord knows and has equipped our body to know who that is. And what we also clarified over the last couple of weeks is the God-pleasing ways that we can serve the church. And there is a variety of ways. You probably noticed that on this list and in, in other avenues that there is so many more ways to serve the church than just, you know, the classic teaching a kid's class or leading a Bible study. We are a body... And the body has many parts, and each of those parts has different functions. And so we want to embrace the way that God has designed His church to be. Not forcing people to do certain things and only those things, but the list in front of you today is, is to inspire you to see that there is so much more, uh, many more ways that you can serve the good of the body. And the common denominator in all of us is the spirit that is given to us that has brought us and made us a people who serve. And so find a place to serve, and you will experience joy that God has designed to give you through that by the power of His Holy Spirit. So we're going to keep talking about this, but with all of that in view, the last couple of weeks that we've talked about this, and also all this ministry that is before us, I want to get a lot more practical today as we wrap up this series. If you're ready to take the steps towards becoming a church like this, the one that we've been talking about, then I want to put before you three commitments that you and I need to make. And if we are to make these commitments and practice them continuously, then I believe that we will be found faithful to the Lord, we will be found edifying to one another, and we will be found more compelling to the world in which we want, to, we want the gospel to go forth in. So let me just get right into it. The first one, the first commitment that we need to make is so critical, so important, that if we don't get this right, everything else will crumble. And so commitment number one that we all need to make in the church is to be scripture saturating. And this might sound like an obvious thing, but, but how we view the Bible has massive implications for how we receive it, how we hear it, what we do with it. I mean, you might call it the Bible. The Bible literally is a, is a word that means book. And if all you think of it as is just a book, like any other book, you could read anything else off your shelf to the same effect. Sometimes we call it scripture. This refers to it as sacred writings, which makes it more important than a book, than any other book, but it also just puts it on par with other religious works. Another word, however, is we call it the word of God. And this supposes that this is a divine message from the creator of the universe himself. 
And if that's what it is, then it is the highest, the supreme authority in all things that we do in our lives and in the whole world. Now, it's possible and probable that you use all three of those terms. I do. And the goal of this is not necessarily just to pick the right one and to only use that term. The goal is to understand rightly what the Bible is. And when we understand that, we will know how it is that it affects our lives and what kind of authority that it should have in the church, what we are committing to. And so some people look at the book and they see a dusty old book that has stories in it that they've heard. It doesn't make any difference to them whatsoever. But there are others in this congregation that look at this book and they would give up everything for the treasure that they know lies within it. So what are we reading? What are we looking at when we look at the Bible? I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And in this sermon, it's more of a topical sermon, and so well, I'm going to have you turn to a few different passages, but the first one I want you to go to is 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you want to borrow a Bible, it's on page 996. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, pretty close to the end. And what we find in this passage, what I want you to see is the clearest picture of what the Bible really is, how we are to view it. And if we know how it is or what it is, it will tell us how we are to receive it, even as it's preached, as it's read, as it's studied, as it's proclaimed. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Here's what it says. All Scripture is breathed out by God. That's what I want us to look at. All Scripture is breathed out by God. And I want us to look at this because every single word in that sentence, that phrase, is really important to how we look at the Bible. First, we start with the word Scripture. Scripture refers to those 66 books of the Bible that are contained in the Old and New Testaments. So within that, what are they? They are breathed out. This means that they originated, they came from within its author, and then have come out of him. It says, it is by God, which tells us who it came from, and then that it carries the same authority that God has in himself. And then the word all tells us how much it should matter, how much of it we should consider to be the very words of God, which, as the Bible tells us, every last jot and every stroke of the pen. And so this verse, this phrase, that it tells us that the message of the Bible is as if it was exactly the same thing, as if God were standing here speaking to us directly, telling us exactly what we as His church need to hear. In other words, to disobey the Bible is to disobey God. And so that's where we need to start. Now, we remember when Peter was on the mountain with Jesus, and Jesus was transfigured before him, and he heard audibly, he heard the voice coming from heaven into his ears. He heard God speak. And Peter, reminding us of that situation, even though he was there and that all happened, he says this in 2 Peter. He says, we have something more sure than that. So he was there, he had this mountaintop experience hearing the voice of God, and he says there's something more sure than that. The prophetic word, he says. And how? How is it more sure? How can it be more certain? It's because, first of all, no prophecy, he says, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So this didn't originate with the people who wrote it down, even though they were human. It didn't originate with them, but it came from God, a message from Him. And it says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but, this is how it happened, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So you get this image of uh, uh, the wind going into the sails of a boat. This is how the Holy Spirit guided and inspired the human authors and pushed them along where they needed to go so that every word, exactly what they wrote, was exactly what God intended to communicate. This is how the Bible, even though it's written by, by humans, is considered the Word of God. Not only because of God's direct and indirect involvement can we trust the Bible, but also, and probably more importantly, because of who God is, 
we can trust and must trust it explicitly. Titus tells us that God never lies. And in the Hebrews, it tells us that it's impossible for God to lie and that that is an unchangeable thing. God does not lie. And if this book is from Him, it, there are no errors. There are no lies. There's no deceit in this. To put it positively, in Proverbs chapter 30, it says that every word of God proves true. And even Jesus said that God's word is truth. And so what these verses are telling us is that we hold in our hands, we possess the very entirely inerrant revelation from the king of the ages. That's what we have here. And for these reasons, you and I are to believe that what is in the scriptures is what we need to hear. It is a divine message from God for his church. And if that's what they are, it needs to be the highest authority over everything else in our lives. So there are times when we think thoughts, where we doubt God's goodness, but the, but the scriptures are to be higher than that. They are to be higher than our feelings when all we know is worry and anxiety. They need to be higher than our experiences when our lives are, are filled with trials and we just don't sense that what is it written in the scripture is true. It needs to be higher than our parents when it means that we will disappoint them. It needs to be higher than our church leaders when they get it wrong. The, the Bible if, if we are to be faithful to God, it requires believing and hearing and learning and knowing everything that He has said, He's spoken to us. And we need to be committed to those things. What this means for the people of God is that we need to commit ourselves to saturating in the Scriptures so that they define our reality, they tell us what is right, what is wrong, how things are really are going. They dictate our convictions. They tell us what we are to believe and to do this correctly. And they drive our obedience because we want to obey what God has spoken to us. When you think of the Apostle Paul, he had planted churches and he's installing Pastor Timothy in one of these churches in Ephesus. And with all earnestness, he charges Timothy in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and his appearing with the most earnest and sincere way. He says to him, preach the word. This is, this is his calling. And because Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, then a pastor, a preacher, fails when he doesn't feed God's flock with God's word. And a Christian's spiritual health plummets when they don't find or seek nourishment from God's word either. And so this commitment to, to scripture saturating goes both ways. The pastor, the preacher must set before his people a steady diet of the word of God, of God's truth, and his, where his teaching aligns with God's intended message for, uh, from the scriptures. So this isn't simply talking about the Bible. This isn't simply using the Bible to prove their own ideas or, or points or things that they want to say. This means unfolding what God has intended to say through uh, His Word. That's the job. Nothing more and nothing less. That is what His people need. And believers are to actively hear the Word of God. Not just to say they've gone to church and they've they heard a sermon, but they want to hear this word. They want to be fed by the word. They are to hear it and then to test it and then to hold fast to what is true. In Romans 10, it says that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So if that's true, then a Christian's faith is going to flounder if they are not fed the word of God. And so we need to commit ourselves to being scripture saturating because the point is that the health of this church is directly tied to how committed they are to submitting to the word of God, to knowing it and to understanding it and to being fed by it. So practically speaking, every member of the body of Christ here needs to commit to being scripture saturating. And what that means is that we need to know it. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. 
We need to hear the word of God together. And what happens then is that we begin to get this delight in it. I don't know how many of you could say this maybe years ago, but now some of you are able to say with the psalmist, he says, how sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. So this is what happens when we submit ourselves to the word of God, committing to hear his voice, to know his voice, and to follow him. Another thing that will happen as we continue to preach and sit under the Word of God is that God will speak to you about more than you may even want Him to. I think we all have certain parts of the Bible that we love. We love hearing that God loves us, how much He's done for us, that He's died for us. But there are parts of the Bible where we don't really feel comfortable with some of the things that are said. Or maybe we just don't understand it. But when we submit ourselves to the full teaching of the counsel of God, all that He has revealed to us, He will begin to set the agenda and speak to us things that we need to hear, even if we don't want to hear them. And in this way, as it says in 2 Timothy 3, He'll teach us, rebuke us, correct us, and train us in righteousness, that we may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is what the Word of God will do for us as we submit to it and commit to preaching it and hearing it in our congregation. Another thing we'll do is we'll know God as He has revealed Himself, not as we would like Him to be. Oftentimes we fill in the blanks that we just don't have answers for, and we often make Him a lot more like us than we imagine. But when we listen to the Word, when God has revealed Himself to us and we submit to what He says about Himself and who we are, then we will understand better where we fit into this whole world, this life, and the church. Another thing in, another thing is that we will strengthen our faith as we hear the gospel again and again, week in and week out. And your understanding of the gospel, of the good news of salvation, will be sharpened and will become more clear as you tell it to other people. It also keeps this church's teachers accountable. That when you hear the Word of God being taught, you test it and align it to see if that's what God has truly revealed to us through the Word. And another thing is, it unites us together. That we all find our, our design and our purpose from the same and one divine source. So we need to commit ourselves. And there's some practical ways that you might want to do this. There's no specific way that I have to tell you to do it, but maybe there's some other ways that we, not only on your own are in the Word, but together might get more out and, and submit ourselves to the Lord. Some things could be that when you hear of the passage that's being preached on the weekend, that before it even comes, you spend time praying about it, that you think about it, that you read it before it's preached. Maybe in your small groups, what you'd like to do is, after you hear the sermon, after you hear it preached, and you understand the Word, you let it sit in your minds, and you meditate on it, thinking about it some more, and then as a group, you might want to share, because you know each other, how it is that God is seeking you to apply these truths. Maybe you want to do this at the dinner table, with your kids, or as family devotions in some way. Or maybe it's as simple as just taking what you've heard as the Word of God, taking it out there with the coffee and cookie in hand and just asking questions, talking about what you just heard. Another thing I would encourage you to do is that when the Word of God is preached and you have questions about it, don't leave. Don't leave them unanswered. Ask the person that preached it or ask someone else what it is that this really means. Get your questions answered. And I know that I would love to share more with you than I'm able to do up here in the short amount of time that we have. Another idea might be that you want to get a good commentary and look at the, the book of James, which is what we're going to go into next. And maybe you want to grapple with the text and wrestle with it to get a better handle on it for yourself and how to, how to understand it. And then again, hear it preached to see how things went. Because church, if we abandon our first and highest commitment to the scriptures, then we may not look any different on the outside after a while, but on the inside, the, the spiritual foundation of this church will begin to crack. And our, and our spiritual health and vitality will plummet. And our purpose of what we exist to do will be infiltrated by the world's wisdom and not God's. So we need to commit ourselves. And if you here call Strathmore Alliance your church, will you commit with us, with all of us, 
to be scripture saturating for your own good and for the good of the body of believers here. So that's the first thing. And I spent more time on it because you can see that it is the most critical commitment that we could make as the church. But let's move on to the second commitment. The second commitment is that every believer needs to make is that we need to be body building. We need to be body building. And in previous weeks, we've talked about how the church is like a body, how each believer is a part of it, and we are all united together as one body in Christ by His Spirit. But in this body, none of us here are the head. Christ is the head. He is the master over every part of the body. He controls it. And His Spirit is the life that that animates it, that is in all of us that we have all received to do our part as part of the body. And as we learned in 1 Corinthians 12, each believer is given the manifestation of the Spirit. And the reason why it's been given is for the common good, for the good of the whole body. And so in Philippians, we know that that it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. The Spirit is working. And a prime example for us to understand what that looks like, what is the Spirit doing in us, is as we saw that each of us would have the same care for one another. So I wonder how we're doing at this. Do we care equally about all the members of the body because we are one, not distinct, not separated from each other? After mentioning the well-known fruit of the Spirit, you can think of them, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. All of those things that the Spirit wants to make you become cannot be exercised, can't come out of you unless there's another person to do them for, to serve. And so after Paul walks through the fruits of the Spirit, this is what he says in Galatians chapter 6. He says that we should do good to everyone. That's what the Spirit wants us to do. And then he says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's us. That's the church. Do good to everyone, but especially other believers to one another. So, brothers and sisters, as members of the body of Christ, the same body, do you realize that the Holy Spirit is empowering you to build up the body? So, many times we just think of ourselves as individual Christians and how we are growing, how we are being built up, but you have a role to play in building up other believers in the church. So what what I want to do is go through some of the New Testament commands that are given, and I want to go through a variety of them. And what I want you to see is that these commands are not given to just the pastors or just the elders. There are some of those. But all of us need to participate in fulfilling the, 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 the design of the church, that is to build up one another. So let me read a couple of these. The first one's found in Ephesians 4, and it says this that we are to maintain the unity of the body with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So pursuing unity is a way that the Spirit wants to work through each one of you to build up other believers. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. That's us admonishing one another. You can't do this without other people. And so this is designed to happen in the church. So admonishing one another is what the Spirit wants to work through you to build up other believers. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day of Christ's return drawing near. So encouraging, stirring one another up. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to do through you to build up other believers, the body. Also, Ephesians chapter 6. This can relate to pretty much anyone in our care, especially to children, but others. It says this, to bring them up in the discipline and instruction in the Lord. So we're to instruct one another. We are to teach people about the Lord as we care for them. So one another, to one another, this is what the Holy Spirit wants to do through you to build up other believers. Or Romans chapter 12, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. 
We are to celebrate with one another and support one another. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do through you for the good to build up other believers. 2 Timothy 1 implores us to guard the truth of the gospel. He says, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. So we are to protect one another from false gospels and, and false doctrines and things that are incorrect that according to the scriptures. That's directly connected to our commitment to these, and we need to help one another in this way, and that's what the Spirit wants to do through you to build up other believers. One more I'll mention is Romans chapter 12. It says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Again, this is sharing our wealth, our possessions with one another as the Holy Spirit wants to do this through you for the good of the body. So do you see how these commands don't work without the church? They don't, they don't come to fruition. This is what the Holy Spirit is working in us. And every member has a role to play in building up the body. And the reason why I read these verses specifically is because these are the ones that are directly related to and basically cover everything in our church covenant for membership. This is what we're asking people to do as members of our church. And if you think about it, you as a Christian should already be committed to doing these things. So that is what it means to be a part of the body, building one another up in our own unique ways as the Spirit leads us. But I know that there's some people here that are still wondering about the formality of membership. Why do we have to sign a piece of paper to say the things that I'm already saying I'm doing? And for you, I want to give you an analogy, and then I want to give you some practical uh, reasons why membership is important. I want you to imagine a couple, and they are head over heels in love with each other. And so they're getting married, and uh, they want to commit their lives to one another, to love each other, to serve each other, to do what is good for one another, and so they're getting married. So at the ceremony, the, the groom begins to express how much he loves his, his fiancée his soon-to-be wife. He's saying, I'm committed to you, and he proclaims these in vows to his wife. And, and there, and she is encouraged, she's hearing this, and she loves it. And then, when it's her turn, she says, do I really have to say it? Like, you, you know that I'm already committed to you, right? Why do I have to tell you what you already know? And so I want you to consider this. When people are speaking wedding vows, they're not teaching their spouse anything new, I hope. They should already be well known that they are committed to one another, that they love one another, and that they are going to do these things that they're vowing to do. But what they're doing is they're expressing a commitment verbally, out loud, as, uh, and their intentions for what they're going to do for their spouse, what they're going to avoid with their spouse. And so they're saying them in a way that this wedding formality is actually helpful. It proclaims their love, it proclaims their commitment to them, and, it, and it, it states for everyone publicly to know that they are committed to one another. Do you remember their wedding, their vows? That's what they committed to one another. And so I want to say this, that it's, it's similar to the way that we agree to and sign a membership covenant at a local church. It's helpful in practical ways as well. It is a public statement, it is people coming up perhaps and saying, I am committed to this local church to serve them, to love them. And if, you've already, if you're already doing that, what's, what's the harm in, in coming up and telling people this? It's, it's a public statement, but it's also helpful. And I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 13. There's a lot of verses that I already talked about in terms of what we are to do to one another or for one another, how to serve. But if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 13. And if you're borrowing a Bible, it's on page 1010. This is a command for every believer, and maybe one we don't focus on a lot, but this is what it says. Hebrews 13, verse 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So, obey and submit to your leaders. And God has prescribed elders to be in the church to give leadership to local churches. And each church should have leaders like this. Now, who is or who are your leaders? 
As a Christian, you say, this is the word of God. I am to obey my leaders. But who are they? How do you know who they are? Is it every pastor you've ever met? Is it all the preachers that you've heard online teaching you about the Bible? No. It would be those leaders in the local church where you have committed yourself to building up that body. And for the other side of it, the elders are to, look what it says, to keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So how do the elders learn or know who it is that they're supposed to give an account for? If people aren't going to tell them, I'm submitting, I am obeying to the local church. How am I supposed to know who I have to give an account for to God? Is it everyone who's ever walked through the doors of this building? Is it everyone, all the Christians in Strathmore? How do I know? And you see, membership is actually a practical help to the leaders of this church, but it also helps you to know who your leaders are and saying, I'm committing to this command, obeying and submitting to my leaders. So there is a practical element here. Another thing that we don't like talking about is this idea of church discipline. And perhaps it doesn't happen very often, but it it mostly makes people worry about what are they going to do to me if I were to to sin. Church discipline often comes in with people who live in sin and are completely unrepentant. They're, They're confronted. We are to confront one another, love one another enough to correct each other. And when you come to someone who's living in sin, who, who cares nothing, they're, they're not, they're claiming to be a Christian, but they're not living the way, obviously, that Christ has called them to live. And so you might approach them as your friend in Christ. And if they don't listen to you, Jesus says, go and get one or two more and confront them the same. This is out of love for their good and their faith. And then it says this, that if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now again, who is the church? Is it the whole global community of Christians in the whole world that we're supposed to broadcast this guy's sin and ask people to, to, we're we're supposed to tell the church? Or is it a local church where this guy is claiming to be a part of, to be a Christian in, to be committed to? And then again, it says, if he refuses to listen even to the church, so again, has every Christian in the world had a chance to persuade him to try to have him repent? Or is it the local church body? If he refuses even to, to, to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, to treat him as a non-Christian because he's completely disregarding who Christ is and what he's called him to do. This is what Jesus said to the, to, about the church before he even died. He, he knew that there would be a church and the church needs to build each other up. And one of those things that we need to take more seriously is this idea of Christian friendship, that it's building each other up, and that even includes correcting one another when needed. Obviously to be done in love and can go terribly wrong if we don't. But the church in Corinth, you remember that church, it was messed up. They had a lot of things going on there. And there was a man there who was sexually immoral with his father's wife. And he wasn't repenting. And Paul says, you need to remove him from among you. If he will not repent and not live according to what Christ has called him to, he doesn't even care, then you need to remove him. And that's what they did. And the question then is, how can you remove someone from your church, from being in the church, if they were never in the church in the first place? So membership identifies you publicly to say, I'm a part of this local body. And we need to to make this commitment. And so membership actually helps protect the family of God to purify it, but also as a witness. It protects the witness from professing Christians who have shipwrecked their faith. This is good for the church. We we need to be able to identify who are our people and who are not. Because there might be some people in the church who are saying, yeah, I go to Strathmore Alliance, and you're thinking, no, 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 no. We don't, that guy is not a Christian, or he doesn't live according to these, these ways that God has called us to. So membership, yes, it it might submit you to leaders, to discipline in some ways, but this is for the good. And if we're going to commit ourselves to Scripture saturating, we're going to be disciplined all the time. Because the Scriptures are constantly refining us, telling us where we are lacking. In Hebrews it also says, For the Lord disciplines the one He loves, and He chastises every son that that He receives. And so I think we need to take more seriously this idea of correcting one another when we need to. 
When the Bible says uh, confess your sins to one another or forgive one another, this is, this is part of being the church. It's not an easy part. It's not a part that we may like, but it is for the good of the whole body. Do you agree with Proverbs 27? It says, better an open rebuke than love that is concealed. Does that make sense? And, and faithful are the wounds of a friend. This is what we need to be for one another, for the, for the holiness of one another. We seek their holiness, their good, their purity, as we all live together as one body. And so together we're bodybuilding, we are strengthening one another for their good and the good of the whole body. So as unpopular and, and useless as formal membership is thought to be, it's actually very helpful and, and it strengthens and protects the body of believers. And so what this body at Strathmore Alliance needs is the commitment of every believer to be a bodybuilder. And, and according to God's design, each one of us are indispensable for the good of the body. God is so sovereign that He knows you were going to be here. He brought you here. He's designed you with a specific role to play in building up the body of Christ. And we all need to commit ourselves to doing those things by the Spirit that empowers us to do them. So will you commit yourself to this church, this group of believers here, to building them up, even to make a formal commitment to them to say, as long as I am here, I'm committed to loving and serving this group of believers. Because your commitment to a local church shouldn't be comfort-based. What I mean by that is you wait until it feels right to be a member, because that day may never come for any church. What it should be is calling-based, in that you commit to loving and serving the local church because that is what God has called you to do. That's the second commitment, being a bodybuilder. Now let's look at the third one. Commitment number three for every believer in the church is to be truth-telling. You need to be, you are, an evangelist. And I know that that word conjures up some images of going door-to-door -door and annoying people or being on TV and asking for money or going and selling everything and going across the ocean to, to tell the gospel to a people group that's never heard it. But it's a lot more simple and straightforward than, than that. It means that you herald or you proclaim or you declare the good news, the saving truth of Jesus Christ with others. There isn't one way to do this. But there is one gospel that we are to share with the world. And because of our first commitment to being scripture saturating, our accuracy of the truth over time will continue to be sharpened. And the way in which we tell people these things, we will give the details of who God is a lot more clearer over time. And we will explain who we are and what our problem of sin, how deep it goes within us, because it will be according to the Bible. And according to the Bible, we will, we will share what God's Son and His saving work has done to accomplish for sinners like us. We will also urge them towards repentance and faith and really detail what those things actually are. So over time, even if you don't feel like you are, you are the evangelist, you are an evangelist. And your own story of the gospel and how it's shaped your life is a testimony to its truth. So as we, as we saturate ourselves in the scriptures, we're reminded by Jesus, which said, uh, the scriptures lead to eternal life because they bear witness to him. And so the more we know Christ, the more we will understand the gospel. But there's more, more to it than that. Because the people that we're calling or, or encouraging to put their faith in Christ, we, as we share this good news, also need to have faith in Christ. This is how evangelism works, because we can't create faith in the person that we're telling. So this is God's work. Like Paul, he says, he did not come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Your eloquence, that, that's not the priority. But what he did do was he said, I knew only Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that's what he did. And why did he do it? So that their faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Are you willing to allow God's power to do the work as you just share the news, this wonderful news with the world? 
So you and I are to plant the gospel in people's lives by sharing it with them, telling them. We are to water it by continuing to do this in a variety of ways and circumstances. But when it comes to the growth, when things start to happen in their lives, that is God's work. And so will you trust? Actually, we have to believe that the gospel, as God has said, is the power of God for salvation. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So the power is in the message. God uses that as you tell it. It's not you. It's God who is working through us. And we need to get that right. That is not on us. I've said it before. We're in marketing. God is in sales. And so we need to just be faithful and tell the gospel truly. So that's individually, we often think, with our neighbors, our friends, our family. But how does this work in the local church together as, as, as a body? Well, as long as we're preaching the word, then we will... Well, 2 Timothy 3 also says that it is able, the word is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So the, the, the unbelievers that are among us, that we invite to be a part of a service like this, they will see and hear how it is that a sinner can be saved. What we all believe. They'll also see it in the way that we do baptisms, which is a picture of how Christ has transformed somebody's life. They have been united with him in his death, dying to sin, and also raised to, uh, back to life, to walk in newness of life, the Bible says. And so they're seeing these pictures of the gospel. Even communion is a picture of how we continually trust and have intimacy, a relationship with God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And in addition to these church practices that we should do, we should continue to do, every one of you here has a gospel story of how you have been transformed, how you experience the saving power of Jesus in your life. And if we invite people into this body of believers, how many other people could share their story with these people to say, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Friends, we possess and are experiencing the good news in our own lives, even today, that we have eternal life today. We know of the one and only way for sinners to be saved from the wrath of God for the eternal joy of God. And He has made us, as the church, 1 Timothy tells us, we are to be a pillar and a buttress of truth. That means that we lift it high, the gospel, so the world can see it. And this, we must be scripture-saturated, and we must be willing and loving enough of the world to share it with them, to tell them to help them and encourage them to trust in Christ as well. And an important part of that is your involvement in evangelism as the whole body. So those are the three commitments that we need to make as a church, as individuals and as a body of believers, being Bible-saturated, being body-building, and truth-telling. In fact, this, this sermon itself is almost like a commentary to the mission statement of Strathmore Alliance Church which is this, we exist to glorify God through knowing, living, and proclaiming the truth and love of Jesus Christ. Do you see those three things and how they're connected? We, we want to know the scriptures, live by the Spirit, and proclaim the gospel to the glory of God. So let's move into this next season of this church's existence with the commitment to these three things. And I believe that as we imagine what could happen, what might happen if we are committed and we move forward, continuing, continually practicing these things, I think what we can imagine is what God has intended for the church the whole time. I hope you have a, you've had a chance to poke your head around downstairs and, and see how, how we've upgraded and uh, made re these renovations have significantly improved the look and the layout of our lower level. But I do want to say there are much more renovations to be done around here. And I'm not talking about the upper level. I'm talking about the most important rooms in the church. That is our minds and our hearts. These need to be constantly renewed by God's Spirit. No matter how beautiful this building may be, the most beautiful church is the one that continues to be renewed by God's Spirit. And this is why my, the sermon points 
and our mission statement deliberately have the ing, the ing at the end of those words, because those things for us as the church are never done. So we were created, we were designed, and we were empowered for a marvelous God-intended purpose. I want to read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 to, to close. And there it declares what God has ultimately united his people for. And it is magnificent. It says this, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Each believer is brought together to be a body. And this body exists to display to the universe, the farthest reaches of the universe, what God has always planned to do. This is bigger than, than you. This is bigger than us. This is global and, and beyond. And this is what God is doing. So church, will you commit to doing these things for the glory of God together? As long as we are existing as a church here, before the return of Christ, and until then, would you commit to doing these things? And in Ephesians chapter 3, after it says that, Paul moves into a prayer that I believe fits well with this. So let me pray this for us as I close. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.